I'll uh, get get going. Hmm. Okay, there we are. Good. Okay, yeah. So uh, th thanks, Ed. Uh, basically, I think I agreed to give a very crash course into some basic data visualization with Python, and I must stress the word basic. Uh, this is really the starting block for us to perhaps build upon um, data visualization in some future sessions if people want to do that. Now I'm hoping that this document will actually become relatively dynamic and updated as we progress through this, so you can think of it as a bit of a uh, Rosetta Pebble, so it's the smaller baby version of the Rosetta Stone, and you can reference back to it um, in the future if you ever have to do any plotting with Python. And now I've put a little bit of an introduction. I've tried to make it a bit like a tutorial in, in some ways. Um, so really the introduction is just saying data visualization, incredibly important. Uh, it's an important step in data analysis. Uh, it gives you an idea and a feel of what's going on with your data. And it helps you to communicate your results to other people as well very quickly. Um, I, you know, generally speaking, people like to see graphs rather than tables or very wordy explanations of uh, of your data. Now, most of you should be familiar, I would hope, uh, with ggplot, which is arguably one of the best data visualization packages. I know Ed uh, does prefer. Uh, base R, but I also know that he does uh, recognize that ggplot does have, um, you know, so, some good points to it as well. Now, ggplot isn't natively available in Python, but Python does have some pretty good options for data visualization. So, plotting in Python, there are huge numbers of Python libraries available for data visualization. Probably the most well known, and I'm sure uh, Ed and Joe Mahango can either agree or dispute this, but I think the most well known is uh, matplotlib, which is basically just a 2D plotting library that you can produce pretty good, uh, high quality figures that are ready for publication uh, quite easily. Now, matplotlib is, from my experience, and I'm, I would consider myself relatively um, relatively new Python user, probably you know about a year or so properly using it. It's quite difficult to understand in some ways. It's quite complex. There's a lot of uh, syntax issues uh, or not issues, syntax, uh, you know, that you need to be aware of in order to use it. So many of the different Python data visualization libraries are actually extensions that make matplotlib uh, a little more accessible. And the two most popular ones that I've come across so far is one called Plot9, which is basically an implementation of the grammar of graphics in Python, and it's based very loosely on ggplot2, although it's not exactly the same. And the one that we are going to look at today is called Seaborn, and it's a high-level interface for drawing statistical graphs. At this point, I should stress that you can do a lot of very simple plotting um, using pandas. Uh, you can make most basic plots using the pandas package, and I'll explain what that is as we go through this. But we are going to focus on Seaborn because pandas is, is OK, but it's a little bit clunky, and Seaborn streamlines the entire, uh, the entire process. And you can also make some interactive uh, data visualizations using Plotly, which is available in, um, in, in R as well. But we're not going to be looking at that uh, today and but I'm willing to do something with that in the future if there's um, if there's any appetite for it. Same with matplotlib. Uh, if people want to get a bit more complicated, then uh, I'm happy to do that in the future as well. So I'm just going to run through some code very very briefly, and we're going to look at four different types of um, of plots in this session. Clearly, we don't have time to go through every single type of plot and every different way of making it. So I'm just going to show you the ways that I would make them. And we're not going to do any customization today. We're just going to look at creating the absolute bare bones plots. And then perhaps in a couple of weeks, if Ed is uh, happy with it, I will run another session on customization and uh, various other bits and pieces. Now, 
to start off with, this is just a bit of a trick that um, I've picked up over my time using Colab. When you, I mean, most of these packet uh, libraries, sorry, are natively installed. So NumPy, Pandas, SciPy, Matplotlib, and Seaborn are all natively installed in Colab, so you shouldn't have to install them. But what I tend to find is you get the uh, least sort of uh, up-to-date version of them. So I always run this line of code with the uh, um, dash U, capital U, in front of it, and that will just update all the packages to the latest current versions. So you can see above this line here, that is essentially the same um, piece of code, but we've just added this extra piece here to make sure we've got the updated uh, packages. So complete personal preference, you don't have to do that, but I just like to do it. And then as Joe Mahango uh, very nicely described um, last week, we're just importing the packages using the import function, the name of it, and then as NP, PD, um, and various other things. These are just common um, sort of abbreviations for the for the packages. And I've outlined exactly what we're doing with them here. Even though we're using Seaborn, not matplotlib, even though it's um, we're not using it, it's dependency for Seaborn. So Seaborn is built upon um, matplotlib, so we're going to have to import it in order to use that Seaborn package. And then NumPy, Pandas, and SciPy are just various bits and pieces for um, you know messing with the data and getting it into any format we might might want to. So we'll just run that first code chunk. Hopefully, it should all be fine. Because I've been running this this morning. Yeah, all good. So you can see that I didn't update anything here because I've already run this code earlier today. But when you run this for the first time, or if you run it for the first time, you'll notice it takes a little bit longer just to update those various packages and their dependencies. Now, I've tried to do something clever here. So inevitably, I'm sure it will uh, fall apart at uh, any, uh, <laughs> any second now. But I've tried to load a Python extension that will allow me to use R as well as Python in this notebook so that I can actually show you the ggplot code alongside the Python code because I'm banking on you guys being slightly more familiar with ggplot so that we can draw some comparisons between the two. But like I said, this could fall apart quite quickly, so we'll see what happens. So this is just a little bit of code here just to load up the extension. And then um, afterwards, I'm loading uh, my favorite package, but uh, I know it's Ed's least favorite package <laughs> potentially, uh, the tidyverse. Now, anytime you run R code in this particular environment. Now you have to do percent sign percent sign R before you run the R code, and that will allow you to basically just script as if it was R. Uh, once you've got that percent sign percent sign R, you can basically do anything you would do in R Studio, no problem. So if we run that, and fingers crossed, there we are. So it's loaded up the tidyverse. And you get the exact same console message that you would do if you were using R Studio. So no problems there. So we're going to use a mixture of Python and R in this particular environment. Any questions yet or is everything OK? It's all looking good. No comments in the chat. Good. So we'll move on to the data. Um, the data that I decided to go with is a classic data set that's typically included with ggplot. So if I click on the link here, you'll see it takes us just to just the ggplot, uh, one of the ggplot pages, and it tells us about this particular data set. So we're looking at fuel economy data from 1999 to 2008 for 38 popular uh, car models. You've probably all seen this data set before. It's quite often used as an example in a variety of different um, tutorials or blogs or whatever. It's a pretty standard uh, data set. And it's got a number of uh, different variables, 11 in total, uh, 234 rows of data, and various bits of information here. But I've just transcribed those into here so that we can refer back to them if we need to. Now, because this is a ggplot, um, uh, data set. We can't natively access it through Colab, so we have to access it through uh, GitHub. So all of this data is hosted in GitHub. So in order to do that, we're basically just saying that we're going to call this particular data set MPG, mostly because I'm lazy and it stands for miles per gallon. Um, equals, then we're using pandas dot uh, read underscore CSV to read in the data set directly from GitHub. 
uh, and we can hopefully access it there. So if we run that code, it should download it and assign it to a data frame called MPG. So if we just run MPG, so that's our data frame dot head, uh, and then we look at the top five uh, rows of data, we should hopefully, there we are. So this is the data set as you'd find it in R, and we're going to use it for, or as the basis for uh, creating some of the plots. Out of interest, is anybody familiar with this particular data set before? Have they seen it before? I would have thought so, it's quite common. Yeah, Ed's seen it, good. I think it's built into, um into one of the base R data sets as well, and it exists in various versions, but it is a classic data set. Yeah, it's a classic. It's got a lot of variables and you can do a reasonable amount with them, which I think is why it's so popular. Um, but what we're going to do is use it to look at four different um, different types of plot. So we're gonna look at histograms, we're gonna look at box plots, scatter plots, and then finally bar plots. As I said, these are very bare bones, um, standard uh, ways to visualize your data. You might typically use these for uh, exploratory data analysis. And anything we generate today is not going to be publication quality. Um, but like I said, in the future, we can do we can do some stuff uh, with making our, our plots look better. So let's start off with histograms. Uh, I've put basically what a histogram is. Well, I've put what every type of different plot type is uh, in the header here, not to be patronizing, but just to remind ourselves uh, what these different plots are used for and what we're going to use them for. So our histograms are used to display the distribution of one or several numerical variables. Now we're going to use a histogram to visualize the distribution of highway miles per gallon. So highway miles per gallon is just one of the variables. So it's looking at basically the, the fuel efficiency of that particular car on a highway in the US. I presumably it's the US because it's highway. I don't know anywhere else that says that uses the word highway. I think they're equivalent, I think, to our motorways, but probably much bigger. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. So this is where it could fall apart. So our basic. Ah, OK, she's got a question. How could I download the data as CSV? So you would just need to go through to the GitHub uh, G, and there should be a download option directly from there. Otherwise, you can just read it straight into Colab uh, using um, PD dot read underscore CSV. Then the uh, the link where the data is in in the parentheses. Uh, that's probably the way I would recommend doing it. It's much easier if you download it directly. You're going to have to upload it to your Google Drive and then import it that way. Um, I've just taken a bit of a shortcut here. OK, so our histograms. So what I've done here is I've tried to create a very basic histogram using ggplot. So we've got that percent sign percent sign r piece of code just to say that this um, code chunk is r. Then we have the classic code. You should, this shouldn't be too much of a surprise to any of you, but it's basically just your ggplot function, the data you're plotting, then we're using the plus sign to use uh, to specify the aesthetics. In this case, our X axis is the uh, highway miles per gallon, so HWY. And then another plus sign. And then we're specifying that our uh, geom is going to be a histogram. And I've specified the bin width here to be four. That's purely just from having a look at the graph that was initially produced and the defaults didn't look that good. So if we run this, I'm not going to spend too much time dwelling on the GG plots because we should be familiar with them. And this is a Python uh, group. You can see we produce a very basic GG plot um, here. There's nothing, no surprises here. We've got our um, highway miles per gallon along the bottom, and we have our counts here along the Y axis. Pretty standard. This is what you'd expect. There's no um, changing of its appearance. This is a totally bog standard GG plot. So how can we replicate this or make something similar using the basics in uh, Python using Seaborn? Well, Seaborn has a 
function called displot that we can use to create a histogram. And the way we call this is just by using that abbreviation for the library name, so SNS. Um, dot displot, and then we open up some brackets, and within these brackets we are essentially saying that we want to take the MPG data, so on the name of our data frame, MPG, and we want to take this particular variable, HWY, which is that highway mass per gallon, and that's what we want to plot, and it will plot this automatically on the X axis. Now what we have here um, are some extra options. So if I run this piece of code, let me just do a little bit of editing. If I run this piece of code as standard with just that, it will create the histogram and it looks quite nice, but it gives us a kernel uh, density, which I've misspelled, kernel density curve here, which isn't typical uh, as you'd expect in a GG plot, but a lot of people do add these. So if we just want to add or remove this to have our histograms that looks like the one we created with GG plot, we need to specify that our uh, kernel density curve uh, is false and then uh, rug is false. So you don't need to worry about this too much uh, in this particular instance. So if we run that now, we should end up with a very nice looking histogram that is broadly similar to the histogram that we created with ggplot. So in essence, you can create a basic histogram in Python in Seaborn uh, using Seaborn using just this piece of code here on um, line two of this code chunk. So as you can see, it's a much, much smaller piece of code than ggplot, and you get broadly the same, same effect. Is that all clear? Is that okay? Yeah, good. Okay. Now, if we want to do something a little fancier, I don't have a GG plot for this, but perhaps say we want to show uh, or display two different distributions on one graph, uh, we can do that. We use a slightly different function from the Seaborn library this time. We're using hist plot, and the color, uh, sorry, the color, the, the concept is generally the same. So we have our library name. Is ggplot access in the same MPG object as Seaborn? Uh, yes, it is, Joe. I think the uh, difference is in the bin width, the defaults. Yeah, I just haven't messed around with the bin width from the Python one. Yeah. But I mean, they're broadly comparable, I think. So ggplot can access a pandas data frame. Uh, yeah, that's correct, Joe. And you'll see you'll, there's another example of that later as I go into this. Like I said, it's a bit of code that I've been working on for a few days. Uh, and I think it works seamlessly, but oh, we'll find out uh, as this progresses. But as I said, Ed, Ed's already uploaded this, so you can mess around with this to your heart's content and build upon and probably make something much better than I've done here. Um, where was I? Sorry. OK, yeah, two, displaying two distributions in one graph. So we can do that quite easily using uh, the hisplot function from Seaborn. So we essentially have to do it twice for each distribution. One hey, can, I, can I ask a question? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, sure. The Joseph's question made me think that I, I just I just blithely accepted that you've uh, used Python functions to plot a an R data object and I just wondered if what allows you to do that was that library, um, the R2Pi or whatever it was called. Yeah, up here in this so the second bit of code. Basically, without that, you can't do anything. Yeah. Um, it's I don't understand the full uh, code un underlying it. It's incredibly complicated. Yeah. Um, I could probably pick it apart, but uh, it's a nice cheat way of being able to use both languages in the same environment. Uh, you and I have talked before about using R in the Colab environment, and you even showed me a way before, and I, I found it even for myself. It was a bit clunky, and and I just, R Studio is so easy, but but actually with that little thing and just the little syntax, um, 
this is doable to me and if, if magic happens like you can <laughs> go between python and r and data objects it's pretty cool i like yeah it's a, it's a bit of a game changer i must admit um i've enjoyed playing with it for the last couple of days yeah that's cool okay where are we histograms here we are yeah so two distributions one graph you're basically using this hist plot function from the seaborn package and within this, all we're doing is specifying our data frame. So MPG, nothing's changed there. So the first one we're going to plot is that highway miles per gallon. And I've just given it a sky blue color, which matches the histogram above. And I've also created a label to say what it's going to be. And I've added that kernel uh, density curve. Now the same uh, piece of code, but below, all we're doing is changing the um, the the variable we want to plot this time it's um city miles per gallon so we're looking at the uh the miles per gallon that you can achieve on a highway where presumably you're at a reasonably constant speed and city traffic where you're a little more stop start and presumably you have a uh, higher or lower miles per gallon i've given this one a different color to make it easier to distinguish between the two and i have uh labeled this one city mpg now these labels are uh, important because it enables us to differentiate between the two beyond the color, but it also allows us to add uh, a legend with some information on it. So if we just run this code chunk, we should get, here we are, a very basic histogram showing two different um, distributions for our mass per gallon data. The light blue one there is the highway mass per gallon, and as you can see, as, a, as it's reasonable to assume, you have higher mass per gallon on a highway. And in the city, you have uh, lower miles per gallon. So I think it's, you know, it's quite straightforward and quite easy to actually create these histograms using Python. And in a lot of ways, it's a little bit less code than it is to do it in uh, ggplot. But I'm sure Ed could whip something up very similar in base, base R with, with even fewer lines of code uh, if, if he wanted. OK, cool. Any questions on histograms or Seaborn in general at this point or? You know, is the is the syntax for Python uh, OK? Is anybody struggling? I'll take silence as a everything's OK and I'll move on. So far, so good. Looks good. OK, good. So moving on to um, another very common plot type for. Um, for exploratory data analysis, the classic box plot which just summarizes the distribution of a numeric variable for one or several groups, we can quickly get the median quartiles and outliers from these. And in this particular uh, group of box plots, we're going to be looking at the effect of car type, which is known as class in the data frame. And we're going to be looking at the highway mass per gallon again. So we're going to be looking at, does your the type of car that you have impact its uh, fuel efficiency on a highway? in essence. And again, we've got a very basic uh, box plot that we've created with ggplot. So this is really, you know, bare bones stuff, nothing pretty here. It's uh, it's your standard box plot. Now along the bottom, you can see we've got our classes and, the, and they're labeled as you might expect. So we've got two seaters, presumably some sort of sports car, a compact car, a mid-sized car, a minivan for the families out there, a pickup for um, Ed, subcompact for your, your city uh, drivers and then an SUV. So pretty standard groups of cars and you can see that their fuel efficiency on highways is pretty variable. Good, so this code is nothing. There's nothing special here really. This is all should be totally um, bog standard to you by now, but if not, uh, let me know and I can go through it. How can we replicate this using Seaborn? So Seaborn basically has a function called box plot, as you might expect. And within that, all you need to do is specify your x, um, x axis um, and your y axis. So, ooh, am I still there? Sure am. OK, so your x axis, which is our class as our vehicle type and our y axis, which is our highway miles per gallon. And here, instead of putting data equals uh, MPG, which I could have done, I've just um, specified the data frame uh, outside of some square brackets around each of the uh, the two uh, axes. <laughs> so if we run that, here we are. We get, a, again, 
another uh, box spot. This one's not particularly attractive either because it's got these horrible colors in them, but we can look at customizing that again in the future. But you can see that we are in essence getting the same um, the, the same uh, plot as before. We do have slightly different ordering on our um, on our different classes here, but I wouldn't worry about that too much. I'd throw in a comment here that um, I find um, the style, the default styles are over the years, it, I, I've softened in my opinion of um, ggplot style. It looks a little flamboyant compared to base R, or maybe, you know, you could say base R is very conservative compared to ggplot, but but you look at seaborn plots, and I mean, they're like the candy colored clown of uh, <laughs> plots here. I mean, the style here is really designed for, um, you know, whereas base R is designed for a um, conservative scientific audience emphasizing only the information uh, these have you know it's it's nice in a way I love the use of color but you know this is not really appropriate for a scientific graph but uh, it does look aesthetically pleasing it's just a, a thing that crossed my mind I've noticed this with the seaborn plots as I've been playing with Python a lot myself lately and their use of color you know it's funny yeah they they, they love color I'm not sure why, but in the future, uh, you know, we can do a a uh, smartening up the, the appearance of seaborn plots, no problem whatsoever. But I think if you're really going to go down a hardcore publishing route, you're probably going to resort back to the uh, map map plot, I would guess. Anyway, so we can definitely do something with that in the future. Everything looks colourful in Python. It's not as serious as R. R's a serious business, Joe. OK, good. So we've got our basic box plot. You know, it's totally usable and you could modify the appearance of that if you wanted to. However, uh, one of the criticisms of box plots relatively frequently is that you don't have the individual points overlaid, so you can lose a little bit of the information in them. So we can address that by overlaying a, a strip plot onto our box plot. So our box plot code remains exactly the same as it did before. However, we're using another seaborn um, function called strip plot to essentially add in that extra layer of information. So in this case, I've used the data equals MPG to specify my data frame, but I'm using the exact same information as above. X axis again is class. Y axis again is the highway miles per gallon. I've colored them orange just to really stick with that seaborn theme to make it vibrant and um, slightly migraine inducing. I've added a slight jitter and I've made their size 2.5. So this is really these three options here are really how you modify the appearance of these dots. So if we run this, it's not that easy to see. Admittedly, I should have gone for a less uh, um, bright color, but you can see that we've overlaid the points on top of our uh, box plot now. So we get a little bit more of that information back uh, onto our histogram. Now you can play with these and make them more aesthetically pleasing if you wish, but what this does is it gives you the, the framework to, develop, uh, to deploy your own um, box plots with a strip plot over the top very easily in two quite short lines of code. OK, good. Is everything OK with box plots? Is there anything anybody would like to see? Do you think I'm not covering enough on box plots and various other bits, or is this just enough to whet the appetite? Oh, this is good. It's really interesting to me to see the um, the contrast with the ggplot style. Good. Glad that's useful. Took a while to get it working. <laughs> okay, so let's move on to scatter plots. So scatter plots are, you know, they display the relationship between two numeric variables, and every data point is represented by a circle or some other shape if you decide to change that. But generally speaking, the default would be a circle. And we're going to use a scatter plot to visualize the relationship between engine displacement, which is measured in liters, and the highway miles uh, per gallon. So again, we've got another very basic GG plot um, to, to, to make this scatter plot very basic again, but this one should be immediately obvious to you. I think this is the one that Hadley Wickham rolls out quite frequently and whenever he does um, GG plot stuff on Twitter or wherever. And you know, very bare bones, 
but it does the job. It's displacement on the x-axis and miles per gallon for the highway on the y-axis. Now we can uh, create again a basic scatter plot very easily using the uh, reg plot uh, function from Seaborn, and we just need to specify the x and the y-axis uh, information here. So for the x-axis, we're going for displacement again, and for the y-axis, mass per gallon. And you'll notice here we've got this fit underscore reg. Uh, that's basically enables you to fit a regression line. Uh, I've turned it to false just to show you what it looks like without. So you can see that it's exactly the same as our GG plot. But if I add it to true, it should hopefully if it allows me to change it. Should sure going on here. Should now get a regression line just over the top of that which is quite a nice handy feature, but it depends on what you're trying to achieve, right? So I would just wanted to have the, uh, the scatter plot that's comparable to GG plot. Very easy, very simple to do this. It's not, this isn't uh, that challenging to do. However, you might want to add an extra layer of information to your uh, scatter plot. So maybe you want to color some of the points according to another variable, uh, but it's a categorical variable. And you can do this again in ggplot. So all you need to do here is add a um, argument, but it's color equals um, class. So class is the type of car, remember? So if we run this, we should get a ggplot that is in essence the same as the one we've already seen, but it's colored the dots according to the type of car. So we can look at the, whether there's some sort of relationship between the engine displacement size, the miles per gallon on the highway, and the type of car. Very easy to do this, and it's very easy to do this in uh, Seaborn too. So we can do that using the LM plot um, function. Again, we've just got the same information for our X and Y uh, axes. The data is the same, it's the MPG, nothing's changed. We've got no regression line here again. Now, the way that we specify we want to turn this, um, to use this class for the type of vehicle in our. Uh, scatter plot is with the argument hue so hue is essentially color and uh, so we're going to say we're going to color these points according to this categorical variable class and we're not going to have a legend on this uh, at this particular time because the legend default position just plots straight over the top of our dots so you'll notice there's a second piece of code underneath to just move that legend to the upper right corner where there are no points for it to uh, to interfere with so if we run that, we get, again, very uh, strange selection of colors, but in essence, exactly the same scatter plot uh, that we have created previously with ggplot. So you can see that these are very simple um, ways to create essentially the same plots as ggplot, and you know, in many cases, much less, um, much less code. I'm slightly interested to just to test. Uh, this is totally, I haven't done this at all. So if I put fit regression to true, if it will do it for each category, presumably it will, but I don't know. Yeah, it does. Okay, good. Useful to know. I didn't I hadn't, I hadn't tested that, but it's interesting to know that just in case you want to do it. Cool. Okay. I, think I noticed on this, I, I kind of have been um, sensitized over the years to notice the uh, way that, especially in R, the passive aggressive Butler treats. Um, character vectors that may or may not be factors and in regression obviously factors and the default as we all know probably is uh, that R will uh, order them unless you tell it otherwise in alphabetical order by the name to each of those factor classes um, but I noticed that it's different in Seaborn it's probably the order that they appear first in the data set which is often the way you want it <laughs> yeah <laughs> B appears out of alphabetical order. Yeah, that's exactly right. So it appears the way it appears in the order, but it is in the data frame, which is good. OK, good. So scatter plots, very simple and easy, I think, um, but incredibly useful ways to visualize your data. So moving on to the uh, bar plots. So, you know, again, I don't want to be too, I don't want to be patronizing here, but bar plots just show the relationship between a numeric and a categoric variable. Um, each entity of the category variable is represented as a bar and the size of the bar represents its uh, numerical 
value. And we're going to use a bar plot to show the relationship between the car type, so that's the class that we've just seen, and the highway miles per gallon. Now, to create a uh, bar plot that takes uh, the mean values across uh, the different car types and the, the, a measure of variation, in this case standard error, we can't just do that straight within ggplot. We have to do a bit of data manipulation. So I've had to create some extra information here and to summarize the data, so a summary data frame, so mpg underscore mean. So I'm just taking the original data frame, I'm grouping it by the thing that I want to plot on the x-axis, which is the car type or class, and then I'm applying summarize to this to calculate the mean uh, highway miles per gallon and then the standard deviation for that. So that is the data frame that I will be in essence plotting in ggplot. And to do uh, this in ggplot, very simple, uh, you just specify your data, the aesthetic values of the x and the y axis, so class and mean hair highway miles are as calculated here. We're going to do a column, a geom col, so that's a bar plot in essence. And then we're going to add some error bars using the values we calculated, so the mean miles per gallon and the standard uh, deviation. So we're subtracting for the lower limits and adding the standard deviation for the upper limits. And if we run that, we'll get what is you know a pretty bog standard uh, bar chart with some error bars. It's fine, does what it needs to do. Not the best way to display your data, and I wouldn't necessarily encourage bar charts, but something to look at um, if you're interested in it. Now, Seaborn has an advantage over ggplot in that you can just use the bar plot function to make the plot, but you can also use it to actually calculate the mean as well as the standard deviation without having to create that separate data frame. So we just need to specify the x and the y um, uh, axes. So the x is the class, so that's the type of car, y the highway miles per gallon. This is all coming from the same data frame, the MPG, so the original one. Our estimator is in essence what um, number we want to actually display on this. and um, We're going to use the uh, NumPy um, library and a function from that mean to calculate the mean for each of these classes. And then we're going to use confidence interval. Um, in this case, we're going to use standard deviation, but you can actually specify uh, a number if you actually want to display the confidence interval itself on this. And then cap size um, zero because just for some reason, I don't necessarily like the horizontal bars on the uh, error bars. And then we've decided to call it light gray to rein in that seaborn um, sort of way that it just loves to be really out there and wild with its coloration. So we end up with uh, the exact same uh, plot that we have above. So very, I mean, uh, this one, because it's light gray, probably looks slightly nicer than some of the other seaborn um, ones that we've, that we've made. But the information is the same. This is the mean miles per gallon on the highway, and this is the standard deviation. So you can see that you can use uh, Seaborn to calculate these pieces of information, plot them all in the same function without the need to uh, create multiple different data frames to work with. Now, the big criticism, and much like the uh, box plots we saw before, is that you lose some of the resolution on distribution of your data because you don't have your, um, your individual data points. So we can just use the same inf uh, same strip plot that we did before with the uh, bar chart to actually do the exact same thing. So in this case, we are using the same information here to create our bar plot, and then we are using the strip plot function with all the same information, uh, just the x and the y axis specified as we do above. Same data. Again, we've gone for the garish orange color and a bit of jitter and the size, and we should have a nice looking bar chart with some with our points overlaid so we can see the underlying data distribution. So those are the bar plots. Again, I wouldn't encourage you to necessarily use these, but if you're going to, I would recommend putting a strip plot over the top so you can see the data distribution. Cool. So the final type of uh, plot that I'm going to show you, and this is one that I don't think will be in your um, uh, your collab notebook. I need to send Ed the updated one because I thought I should include line plots because it dawned on me that they're quite frequently used. And you can use these just to look at how uh, you know numeric value variables change over time. For example, unfortunately, we don't have any suitable variables in that fuel economy data set, so I just generated some dummy 
time series data um, here using um, the pandas package and I basically just generated some random numbers over a set period of time um, and basically just created this data uh, this data frame and then added some uh, columns over the top so if we just run that I should have probably also just so you can see what we're working with so we've just got dates in essence and then a value so it's just daily dates and then uh, a value that we can plot this data means absolutely nothing it's totally random it's just time series data and we can use uh, this data here uh, again with our gg plot to create a very basic line plot oh this has not gone to plan okay let's not dwell on that point too long i need to go back and figure out what's happened there but i will fix that it was working earlier oh uh, okay, I think I know what's happened. For some reason, I don't have the correct name. Okay, that maybe isn't the problem. Scroll back up and let's see the um, the data generating code. This one. TS data. And you've got TS data head, okay. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what's going on with this one. This one's, but this one should work, I think. You've got a, do you, do you, why do you have the parentheses around that just out of curiosity? Do you need, you don't need that. Oh hey. uh, no, yeah, you're right actually, that's good. I was just looking for syntax isms. <laughs> yeah, oh. it's still not, it's still not working. Something came up for a moment there. Oh, uh, yeah, that's the uh, Seaborn version. OK, that's I think the, problem. It, it might want the pluses at the end of the lines. Can you zoom in on the ten? No, can you just hold it there? We read the error. Yeah. Ah, so ggplot is not finding TS data. Yeah, I think it's to do with the way that I say I've I've generated this actually. Um, it was working earlier. That's all I can say. <laughs> I don't know what I've done to the code in the uh, in the interim. It kind of links back to the question I asked earlier because TS data is a pandas data frame. Yeah, that's yeah. a good point. So it, it, it definitely can read uh, the pandas data frames because I, I, I was doing this earlier with no issue. But in my eagerness to generate this uh, last one, I think I may have taken a shortcut somewhere oh, all right so i think the problem lies with me not the uh not what i've not the actual code itself i think but i will fix that and get it um get a updated version to ed but in essence you can create these line plots plots very easily using you know the x and the y axis uh, variables could you add a code chunk and um we'll see what happens if you use the r an R code chunk. See what happens if you use data dot frame on TS underscore data and put it into uh, another data object and try that in your GG plot. Yeah, Just sorry. Um, okay, yeah. So you want some R code, and then what do you want me to type? Sorry, Ed. Make a um, new data variable name like uh, new data. Oh, okay, right, yeah, okay. And into it, put data dot frame on TS data, just to see if if it does something just out of curiosity. Nope, didn't like no. that. I, I, I would suspect, like um, Joe Mahengo said, that it was something to do with communicating between Python and, and R. Yeah. There must be a way to do it because you have the utility packages. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, you definitely can do it. And this was yeah. working earlier, but I, was, uh, I, I changed a few things, and I suspect... I've deleted something that was important. Mm. <laughs> would be my guess. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, the, the in essence, the, the take home point really is that you can create line plots very, very easily using Seaborn. 
And then what I've highlighted down here is some further reading is what is a bit of a uh, um, comedic take to going through Python's data visualization landscape. It's a little old now, 2016, but it covers the uh, basis of all the main data visualization pack, uh, libraries that are still used um, today. And it's quite detailed, quite funny. Uh, I enjoyed reading it. So you might also enjoy having a read through it. You're not going to learn how to do practical coding, but it's quite nice if you want some background information. OK, that's all I've got, Ed. I think that's great. That's just just perfectly pitched. Um, I think, you know, I learned some things. I know everybody who watched this will have learned some things. So very cool. I'll uh, you know what I think that it would be cool to have. <clears throat> I, I haven't had the personal bandwidth to do this, but <clears throat> I've been imagining one of those cheat sheets that um, I've imagined various flavors of it, but you've you've made me think that there's a uh, an ultimate flavor of it. So you could have a, a cheat sheet that has to do simple stuff with graphs and other things as well. Base R, ggplot, Python. I mean, I would find that useful because I have asked these questions and had to relearn some of the same things. You've summarized it quite nicely here. So I think this could be a, um, a reference, the uh, reference for the rest of us. It's yeah, cool. no, I mean, I mean, if you want, Ed, I can go back and add in base plot, base R code to this. And maybe it's something that could evolve over time for one of the future meetings, uh, it, maybe even as an exercise for breakout rooms for you know to put us all to work doing it for fun unless yeah. unless you want to put the work into it for fun <laughs> i mean yeah i'm happy to do it but if yeah i mean it could be a good exercise for people to have a practice and um think about how you're translating stuff from r to python and vice versa yeah um yeah, yeah no you know it's a pleasure and i mean is there interest in doing some more of the changing the plot appearances maybe some map plot uh lib stuff i don't know I am interested in Plotly because I've, I've found it so useful uh, to do things. Uh, I, yeah, happy to do it. I mean, yeah, I'm away next week and I think George is doing something next week. Um, but yeah, maybe a couple weeks I can do something else. I think that um, I have always had this aspiration since since I played with Plot, Plotly for the first time a few years ago to uh, to kind of in fold it into my normal workflow where you get um, outliers. It's just it's just kind of a nice way. You can do it programmatically, but uh, for my own workflow, I'm often interacting with other people. And uh, people that I interact with are often not good at all the same things. And so if it's easy to visually uh, play with it, and uh, I, I would be interested in seeing a, a Plotly is is plotly natively implemented in python or is it uh is it ported this way no you can do it natively okay that's yeah. very interesting yeah we have okay maybe um yeah i don't know maybe two weeks time from now yeah we've got some other requests you're now now you've got to do a, a oh, well. python as a gis <laughs> that'll be easy okay yeah oh yeah i don't, I don't mind doing that that should be fine i mean yeah, happy to do whatever people want want me to do on the data visualization stuff. More than happy to do that. Cool, very cool. All right, okay. any any final closing comments here or questions to Joe? Stunned silence. Stunned silence. Well, I, I think the nice thing about these people have given me feedback that uh, that they like the recordings because they like to watch them later, um, and and. If we have the resources, I, I, I put a little effort into designing a way to curate the resources in a better, more easy and accessible way. I hope that was working for people. So uh, we'll put this up there too, and it's there. So thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks, Ed. Uh, I've realized what the mistake is and the, and the line of code. So I'm going to add that back in, and then I'll oh, send show you. Oh, show us. Show uh, us. I would like to see the answer. We still have a minute here. Okay. Uh, two seconds. <clears throat> Can you see my screen? Not quite yet. That might be happening. Oh, come on. Oh, OK. Hang on, sir. That's interesting. It's come up.
come up with an error message? When you share your screen or in the code? Uh, no, I'm never going to share my screen. Ah. Teams, I think that it is very, very resource intensive when you um, when you share screen and present stuff and have the rest of teams going. I was meeting with somebody the other day. It's nobody that comes to these meetings completely different. Um, different circumstance, but it was a student, uh, a low lower student than a, than a researching student. And uh, they were trying to show me a problem and we had a long meeting and everybody, you know, they were very upset uh, and they were on a deadline and everything. And it was important for them to show me their screen when the error was. And so I kind of came to a solution and I left it with them and they contacted me urgently again and um, they couldn't get the screen to work and they were just in tears. And I, I kind of tried to ease the situation by making some jokes. So it was making it worse as I went along. Um, it's like, oh, it's very rare I meet with somebody and um, they're crying before we even start. <laughs> and it was all because of Teams. We figured out they were, it was running out of RAM. It was using all the RAM. There's a memory leak. Yeah, I think this might be what's happening. It's just saying it's just not happening. Uh, all right. I'll, well, I'll, I'll tell you what. Send it through. I'll put up the new version. And if anybody has questions, we can take it to uh, Slack chat. Yeah, no problem at all. Thanks, Ed. All right, cool. Thanks, Joe. See everybody later. Bye, everyone. Have a good weekend.